The story I'm going to tell you is from the 18th century of two men from very different backgrounds. William Cooper was from a noble background and John Newton was from a seafaring background. Both men had such different lifestyle but became very good friends. We know William Cooper because of his hymns that were very popular and also a very famous hymn from John Newton. But the two men became friends and they both became anti-slavery campaigners. The thing is, John Newton was a slaver. He sailed as a captain on the ship Pegasus and was a slaver. But he changed and seeked redemption. Let's look into these two men's stories and find out about them. This is the rectory in Berkhamsted, Hertfordshire, where in 1731, William was born. His father was the Reverend John Cooper and his mother was called Anne. John Cooper was the rector at St Peter's Church here in Berkhamsted from 1722 to 1756, literally just across the road from the rectory, a lovely church. And William was baptised here as well. William wrote beautiful poetry and often mentioned the wonderful surroundings of Berkhamsted in his works. That is the old courthouse we've just shown you and the old cobbles. They would have been here in William's times. William's early life was full of tragedy. There were seven children, but five would only make it to infancy. And then when William was only six years old, his mother passed away. His early life wasn't that good. He was a very sad child. And at school, just along the road from here, he was bullied as well. This is a picture of his beloved mother. Following his schooling, William began training in law in 1749. He attended Middle Temple, followed by the Inner Temple. This is why he was named as William Cooper of the Inner Temple in his published works. At 23, William was called to the bar. In 1755, William's first love was his cousin, Theodora Cooper. He was very much in love with her and planned to marry her. But unfortunately, the family were against this marriage because he had little prospects and also both of them suffered with mental health issues. Throughout his life though, Theodora secretly kept in touch and would send him gifts and money. William was offered a clerkship in the House of Lords, requiring him to appear at the bar in the House of Lords and a test of his suitability. The pressure was too much for him and affected him so badly he tried to take his own life. William became very poorly and attempted suicide. In 1763, he ended up in St Albans Asylum. Luckily enough, he was under the care of Dr Nathaniel Cotton, who was revolutionary for seeing mental illness as an illness and treated him. And he got better and he left there and was sent to Huntingdon to recover in lodgings there. This is how the Collegium in Sonorum would have looked in St Albans back then. Dr Cotton really did help William recover. While in Huntingdon, William made the acquaintance of William Unwin, then studying theology at Cambridge. He was befriended by the family and moved in with them. Mary was really fond of William and treated him like a second son and William was very happy being in lodgings with them. This is Mary Unwin and she became a rock throughout William's life. This is Mary's husband, the Reverend Morley Unwin. 
1767, Morley died in a riding accident. And on the 6th, the day after his burial, John Newton visited the house. And this is when William and John first met. John was living in Oney, where he was curate in charge there. William, Mary and her daughter decided that they wanted to live there too. For the first year, they lived with John and then after a year, they moved out to a place called Orchardside. This is a painting of William Cooper arriving at Orchardside in Orney. We have looked at William's life now up until he met John. Now we're going to look at John Newton's life, a completely different life from William's. In 1725, on the 4th of August, John Newton was born in Wapping. His father, John Senior, was a merchant ship captain. His mother, Elizabeth, got very ill when John was only six years old and just before his seventh birthday, she died of tuberculosis. So just like William, they both lost their mothers at six years old. This is at Wapping Dockyard, not far from where John Newton was born. Very different back then. John's father quickly remarried soon after the death of his wife. And then when John was only 11 years old, the tender age of 11, was sent to sea with his father. In 1743, John was pressed into the Royal Navy to be a midshipman. He didn't want to do this, so he decided to run away. But unfortunately, he was caught and the punishment was to have 96 lashes. The ship called the Harwich was the one he deserted from. Poor John was tied to the mast in front of the whole crew and he received 96 lashes. But not only that, he was immediately demoted. To be absent without leave and desertion in the Royal Navy was considered a very big crime and the punishment was very harsh. What kept John going through this period was his love for Mary Catlett, known as Polly. He'd fallen in love with her the minute he set eyes on her. He was visiting her family when he saw her for the very first time. It was love at first sight. They were distant cousins and she was only a young teenager and he wanted to marry her. And for years and years, he wanted to do this. Unfortunately, he was refused, but eventually, in 1750, they married. Before this very special day, John had been a slave himself. His thoughts were to be back with his beloved Mary. John was a very disagreeable man, a typical hardened sailor, and he would often upset his crew members, so much so that he got left in what is now known as Sierra Leone. And he was taken into the care of Princess Pia. And she treated him the same as he has treated the slaves aboard his slave ships. And he would remain there for nearly three years. Eventually, in 1748, John was rescued. He boarded the Greyhound ship for home. But one night he was woken there was a terrible storm. He had to help in bailing out the water. Part of the ship had come away. Crew members had fallen overboard and were lost to sea. He was very, very frightened and no one thought they would survive. This went on for nearly 11 days of tossing and turning in the sea. John turned to prayer, the prayers his mother taught him when he was a child. He was very frightened, but Suddenly, all was still and they did survive and he returned back home to England. 
the hour I first believed. It's very hard for us to comprehend slavery today in modern times, but back then it was the norm. Men, women and children were taken from their homeland and separated from their families. They were put in irons, they were stripped naked, and then they were marked with an iron. Like a stamp, they meant nothing, they were just cargo. And then they were tortured, they were starved, they were put on these ships, and then they were put into auction and sold and became the property of the person that bought them. Life aboard the slave ships for a slave was living hell. Some of the passengers never even got to shore. In 1755, John's seafaring days were over. He had just got over having a stroke and was too ill to stay in the Navy. He then became a tide surveyor in Liverpool docks. John had always wanted to be a priest. He set his heart on it and for years he tried. Influential friends like Lord Dartmouth helped this happen and he was ordained in 1764. John was so influenced by the preachers John Wesley and George Whitefield. He was known as the Little Whitefield. So, so far we've told you about the early life of William Cooper and John Newton. They are now living in Oney, a beautiful town. But no, it wasn't what you think. Back then it was known as the poorest town in England. We all know of the famous lace making there, but these women were working so hard day and night to make this beautiful lace. It just kept them from the poorhouse. The starvation rate was high in this town. You would think by looking at that picture we showed you, it was different. It was all lovely countryside and idyllic, but it was far from that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Amazing Grace, one of the most recognisable loved hymns written by John Newton. He wrote it when he changed and became remorseful about his past. It's about redemption and being forgiven even though you have committed terrible sins. The civil rights movement use it all over the world. It's still used today. And you can't help feeling a shiver when you hear it sung. We've told you now about their early life, but what about the next part of their life? William Cooper, what did he do to help the campaign? What does do you take sugar mean? John Newton campaigned and he joined forces with William Wilberforce. The next part is going to be just as intriguing. Look out for it, it's coming soon. <laughs>